Hey guys, welcome back to Pass Money Plan. Today's topic, uh, following from the last one, is what our best piece of advice was um, in our life. So, Kirby, you got to start this one off because I try to have you start off the last one. You just pushed it back off. <laughs> All right. So, uh, the best piece of advice. I mean, I I've got some nuggets. I got some nuggets. And I'm, I'm just going to take it through stages. Let's just do it like that. So the when I was when I was busted, broke, the best piece of advice I got was Dave Ramsey, the borrower, the slave to the lender. And, you know, he, I mean, for people that know Dave Ramsey, he went into the whole diatribe of, you know, how that how that comes about. Once I, you know, saw his understanding of it, then getting me from broke to you know, having two dollars, more than two dollars, but having, you know, thousands of dollars in a bank, it got there. But that was the best piece of advice in my early stage of life. Uh, and I'll be one transparent. I'm never going to crap on Dave Ramsey. I'm trying to stay PG-13. I'm not going. I'm not going. I can't. I mean, I don't care how many people on social media crap on it. But I'm telling you from a guy that's like most people uh, in that situation. Everything he said, I need to hear it. I didn't have the financial literacy to do everything more. Um, it was strictly, I need to know how to get out of this run. This run of living less, because I was living, people live paycheck to paycheck. I was living less than paycheck to paycheck. I was living paycheck to two days later. That's, that's where I was at. So I was struggling in between there. So, but I will never crap on Dave Ramsey. He, I mean, he, when, it, when they say change life, that was that was the first initial change life uh topic that brought up that was brought up for me. And then so from there, you know, Dave Ramsey, and like I've explained on this channel before, no matter how many people hate him, Dave Ramsey took me from negative two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to you know a million dollars. So that was the first big nugget I got. But then I fast forward, um one day I uh, I had a call and I always thought this, but I never confirmed it. I was always thinking it, but I never had somebody confirm it for me. Um, you know, a mentor of mine, I'm not going to say his name because I don't know if he, he going to be like, oh, why are you talking about me on here? But um, I was having a conversation with the guy that's in the billions with the beat. And his his advice was don't spread your money thin. Don't spread your money thin, and that word diversification is a fallacy. Diversification meaning buy a lot of stocks, and then you know, and then hope hoping one of them go up. That diversification that you know you hear everywhere else, you know, you buy a whole bunch of stocks, and then if one goes up, then it'll replace all the other bad investments. He said, "Don't spread your money thin. You get a lot of capital." You do the homework and you study one or two investments and then you plow as much money into it as possible. I always thought that, but I never heard nobody else say it. I would think it like, you know, like I told you about the Bank of America trade that I did. I always I did it and it worked for me to, you know, buy my house and stuff like that. But I never heard nobody talking like that until I reached out to this gentleman and he said the same thing. Don't spread your money thin. You know, do the do the work, learn the company, learn the management, learn what's going on in the pipeline, and then and then use a lot of money in singular places. And then that's what I did. And he said, so that was something that I grasped a hold to. And then that's why I always talk about you don't need you don't need five hundred stocks if you want to invest in S P five hundred. Okay, just invest in S P five hundred, but put a lot of money into it. And then the next one, the next one was uh, diversification. Same mentor, he said, when you diversify, uh, diversify, diversify in asset classes, not diversify in a whole bunch of different stocks. So, you know, you have your stock, you know, one, two stocks or S&P 500. Then you invest in businesses, buying businesses, and then you pile a lot of money into that uh, arena. And then you invest in real estate and then you pile a lot of money into that arena. But you diversifying for asset classes, not diversifying with a whole bunch of stocks. 
So those were the three things. But if I can say which one has helped me out the most, and it was Dave Ramsey's getting me on the financial literacy trail. I mean, without that fire he lit up under my butt when I was so broke that I couldn't see, I wouldn't have, you know, been able to meet mentors. I wouldn't have been able to, you know, do all the things. So that initial one was the one that was the genesis of changing everything, everything I did. But the other ones, you know, uh, using money to use, putting a lot of money in one investment. I always thought that made more sense, but everybody always talked about diversifying. So I would always, you know, I would buy a lot of a one stop, but then I'll be buying, you know, a little bit of everything else to be like, oh, I'm diversified. But then when he signed off to say, yeah, you need to focus and don't spread your powder thin and put a lot of money in one avenue, that was something that was a life changer for me. And, you know, then I re I'm, I've been reaping benefits from it ever since. Okay. Yeah, I've got, so then I've got a couple, if we're allowed to talk on a couple. But mm -hmm. uh, Sorry, I, sorry, I, I'm, I'm old, I guess. <laughs> I got a lot of them. Um, no, yeah, and I'm sure I'm going to still hear a lot, uh, a lot more advice that's good advice, but um, so one I would say, and I think this is probably one I heard first in this journey was, um, this is going to sound crazy, but uh, buy when there's blood in the streets, honestly, because um, it kind of specifies what time you need to be buying and investing. Um, the majority of people that I see, they, um, they're buying when it's good times. And so for me, being able to reserve my money in good times and then take advantage when there are bad times, which there's always bad times. I, I, at this point, I've noticed the media does a great job at always creating a bad time. Um, I've been able to use, you know, that capital and buy low. And obviously when it comes up, either sell high or just, you know, depending on if it's stock or whatever, keep it for the investment itself. The next piece of advice um and that that advice that actually that i think that starts from the rothschild right rothschild family back in the 1600s i think they said that when they bought into the napoleon war um and then warren buffett and then you emphasized it the next piece of advice that really stuck with me is um something you had said which was <laughs> you're not going to find the deal you have to make the deal work for you and it's that that because it opens your it opened my mind more to you know it's not just hoping and wishing um, which is a common mentality uh out there but it's finding something and running different procedures in your head running different strategies in your head to see if there's a if there's a way you can get it to where you need it to be and then pulling the trigger and speaking with the seller um, on whatever it might be. And and it doesn't just have to be real estate. It could go for anything. Um, I've no, noticed that negotiating in real estate, that same negotiation, it's just speaking. It can work out in other ways of negotiating, whether you're buying a car or um, you're buying furniture. It doesn't really matter what it is. It's just negotiating with people. And you can always find people's trigger points into how what their situation is, learn their situation, and then kind of, um, yeah, this all sounds crazy, but it's like, kind of like prey on that, like, because you now know where they're at, and you now know what's gonna, what their, what their selling point is, and uh, you can get them to come to the price that you need. Um, and thirdly, I would say question information received. That's a huge one. Between that and uh, making the deal work for you, it just opened my mind more on everything. Questioning information is applicable to everything in life. Um, I remember we were talking about like uh, even doctors, you know, they'll like question doctors. I mean, doctors will you know, we were talking about like the BMI, the body mass index, how they're calling athletes obese because their weight is over what it should be for their height when they're just muscle mass. But like, you know, in a, in a situation like that, where 
don't give someone a title just because, oh, they're my real estate attorney, they're my lawyer, they're my whatever. It doesn't matter. Question what they are giving, what question the information that they are giving you. And I think questioning information is always frowned upon in society because it's expected to just be accepted and it should never be the case. And when you can, from learning to question information received, I've been able to see different aspects of everything. Yeah, and 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 those and the ones that you said was was key and paramount. Um, by uh, blood in the streets, yeah, I could have added that one to mine too. Um, because like like I always tell people, you know, the stock market has a hundred percent recovery rate, hundred percent. And I mean, maybe nuclear war happened and we would never see the highs again, but. The stock market has a hundred percent recovery rate. So if you're gonna buy, if you're gonna buy, buy when it's low and everybody's scared. I mean, yeah, you're scared, but you gotta have that intestinal fortitude to to jump in there when everybody else don't want it. Question information received. That's that's a huge one. Um, that came from a professor from Southern University, HBCU, actually. Um, I heard that one. Uh, uh, like I said, advice come from the strangest places. The strangest places. The first time I heard that was from a gentleman that has no financial literacy, no anything. And then he said, knowledge is the ability to question information received. Not a degree, not anything else. The ability to question information. If you can't question information or articulate a question to question information, you will be in serious trouble. I mean, how many people have said that, oh, went to the doctor, they said this, it didn't work or they went to a financial advisor, or they went to a banker, they went to a real estate agent, and they told them all this stuff, and they, and they ended up in a bad situation because they just listened to these people that got these quote-unquote titles of being a professional or being an expert in that certain area. I mean, I've, I've talked to many of real estate agents. I've talked to many of doctors. I've talked to many of things. And when I talked to real estate agents in particular, and then I started asking questions, and I, I'll never forget it. I was at uh, Cigar International. That's probably not even the name of it, but you know what you want to talk about. The one that you that's, go to. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Yeah. And I'm sitting there at a round table. That's what's called Cigar International? Yeah. Whoa, look at me. I remember. <laughs> but um, I'm sitting there at a, it's, it's a table, and it's like six or seven uh, real estate agents. And then I start asking questions, you know, I'm not going to get into those questions now. I started asking them questions about, you know, certain things. And the consensus was, and this is what one of the agents told me. Well, two or three agents told me. They said, you are the type of people that we don't like. And then I said, what do you mean? Because you're asking the questions that will affect our income. We and they said we just want people to buy the, the highest price house that they can afford so we can get a commission. Once you start asking questions and pushing back on different aspects and avenues, it affects our bottom line. I don't think I just wanted to know, you know, I just asked the questions and then they was like, you know too much about real estate to that we can't take advantage of you. This is what they told me. I'm not making it up. This is what they told me. And I sit there, I'm like, okay. And so from there on out, I ask every question there is, especially when it comes to real estate agents. That's why you don't hear me a lot talk about, oh, I got a buyer's agent, I got this agent. No. I'm going to talk to the people, I'm going to deal with people that's, you know, more straight up and down, more, you know, trying to get me to my goals, not to their goals. If The thing is, real estate agents focus on getting people to their goals more, they will have more clients and everything else. But real estate agents look at it in the inverse is, hey, I just need a couple suckers that's going to buy well outside their means and buy the biggest house so I can do what I want for my family. But if you took care of the person the most, maybe it's not advantageous for you on that deal, but that person will tell everybody else. Because the thing is, is if you take care of them and you put them in the right situation and it turns out great for them, they're going to tell people, tell people. So their clientele, their clientele broke, but real estate agents look for, you know, I just, you know, want, I just need one sucker, one sucker. Forget that. Why don't you have a whole bunch of informed buyers so they will go tell people to get you more informed buyers 
So you're doing deals two, three, four, five, six, seven a month instead of one every six months uh, trying to get by. I mean, yeah, your commission might be a little lower, but you have consistent income instead of, you know, one big windfall, one big windfall once you find a sucker to uh, pay outside their means because they qualify for it. Yeah, that, and that's some other advice, too, that you had given me was as a buyer, you don't need a buyer's agent. And I've seen, you know, being able to share that advice with other people looking to buy a property, uh, it freaks everyone out because they're like, how do, isn't that illegal? Like, no, it's not illegal. Like, <laughs> you know, like I get yeah. the craziest responses, but it's like, you know, you have to, peop, I think one thing people don't do, and one thing I've applied to my life is, I am very selfish, I guess, from other people's perspectives. I always look for what is best in my favor and my family because no one else cares. No one cares about any anybody else in this world but themselves. They may act like they do, but the bottom line is they don't. So I'm putting that up front first. I only care about myself. And in doing that, I will always be successful in whatever I do because I'm putting my ambitions first. And in doing that, you know, it's like you're cutting out all the BS that society wants you to abide by, you know, as simple as something like that, using a buyer's agent. That is the most common thing that is used in real estate with people. Whereas you cut out the agent, you can save yourself and your family on tons of debt, a better deal on the house, whether even if it's not for investing, but a better place to live in at a better deal. Like in every form, you can do something like that. Um, if you just question information received, if you just put yourself first. And with all that being said, we'll see you in the next video. Please like, comment, and subscribe. That subscribe button means press it. All right. Y'all have a good one. See you guys.